Hi, uh, Massimo. By the way, is that how to pronounce your name, Massimo? Yes, Massimo. Okay, yep. good. <laughs> um, so uh, I am John Horgan. I am a science writer, and uh, I've been hanging out here on Blogging Heads TV for, God, a really long time now. I mean, I guess about 15 years. And um, oh. Bob Wright finally uh, gave me uh, my own show, Mind Body Problems. And um, so I have been talking to various people who are uh, interested in, in that. And actually, I think it's impossible not to be interested in the mind-body problem. It's, it's kind of the problem of life, the problem of being a human being. But, you know, we can talk about that uh, in a little bit. And with me is um, Mas Massimo Pigliucci, the, uh, the well-known philosopher, and you've been on the show, you've been on Blogging Heads a bunch of times, right? Yeah, I've been with Dan Kaufman. I've been with Bob. Um, yeah, <laughs> so several times, yes. Well, welcome back, and uh, thanks Thank for you. coming on my humble show. I wanted to start by looking at some big issues related to um, philosophy, um, and I wanted to make it a little bit personal. I hope that's okay. You had training in biology and genetics, and you seemed poised at one point uh, to become a, uh, a professional biologist, but then you switched to philosophy. And I just wonder if you can tell us why you did that. Well, I was a professional biologist for like about 20 years or so. Um, I made it all the way up to the rank of uh, Full professor, um, first at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville and then at Stony Brook University on Long Island. And yeah, I thought that that was going to be the rest of my career. Um, you know, little did I know. Uh, <laughs> so, well, what happened was a combination of things. And at some point in my early 40s, I ran into what might be loosely described as, as a midlife crisis, which is not unusual. It was nothing terrible. Uh, you know, the kind of things that happen in life, you know, your wife divorces you, your father dies. You change job, uh, not career, just job. Uh, you move to another city, you get in a, a new house. The slight, uh, slightly unusual thing was that all those things happened in the same year uh, <laughs> within a few months from each other. Wow. So they kind of had an impact. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what was happening at that point that was that I sort of started asking myself, and like, okay, well, I've been doing biology for 20 plus years and I'm doing pretty well. I'm happy with my lab. It was funded by the National Science Foundation, good graduate students, good postdocs. My research was on gene and vitamin interactions, which is fancy biology talk for nature and nurture kind of things. Like, okay, well, very happy. Yes, but do I want to continue to do pretty much the same thing for the next, whatever, 20, 30 years? Yeah. And it pretty much quickly uh, dawned on me that the answer was going to be, no, not really. <laughs> now, this is not unusual. I mean, a lot of scientists, or I think academics in general, but at least in my experience, scientists, at some point, especially after you get uh, tenure, and, and especially if you reach the rank of full professor, they, you start looking around and for other things to do. You don't want to do exactly the same thing uh, for, for you know, decades. The normal reaction is looking nearby fields. So I was an evolutionary biologist. I might have looked into, you know, molecular biology or, or perhaps ecology or, you know, something like that. Um, in my case, uh, I had an interesting philosophy for a long time because I studied philosophy in high school uh, growing up in Italy for three years. I had a wonderful teacher. So the philosophy had kind of remained in the background, uh, particularly philosophy of science. Mm -hmm. And it also turns out that my interest, even though my research in science was very empirically grounded, we were doing, you know, experiments in the lab, field work, that sort of stuff. But the kind of things that really excited me were more theoretical and conceptual issues in evolutionary biology, such as, you know, the species problem. What, what, what is a biological species? Why do we have so much trouble of figuring out what you would think is other, should be a pretty straightforward kind of problem? Mm -hmm. um, well, those kind of problems have a heavy philosophical component. Uh, because there are problems that are not uniquely determined by empirical answers. It's not that you can do experiments and figure out what species are. Experiments are certainly, and observations are super, certainly relevant. Uh, you have to have familiarity with the biological world in order to even ask the question of what species are. But the answer is very clearly not entirely empirical because otherwise we would have gone in a long time ago. We've been you know, doing research on species for a long time. 
Um, so my interest was kind of already uh, leaning toward the, the philosophy of science. Turns out also that at the beginning of this process, I was at, still at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville before moving to Stony Brook, and uh, UTK hired a bright young philosopher of science. His name was Jonathan Kaplan. Jonathan uh, got on campus and looked me up immediately because he had defended his dissertation at Stanford on gene environment interactions on, on, from a philosophical perspective. So he knew my research. He had looked up my, my stuff. So he called me up. We had, we had coffee. We hit it off very well. We became friends. He started coming to my lab meetings. We started collaborating on joint papers. You know, one thing led to another. And one, one day we were having lunch together. And I said, hey, Jonathan, you know, I've been you know, wondering about what to do next. So I had an idea. Why, why don't I go back to graduate school uh, in philosophy and you become my advisor? And Jonathan looked at me and said, how many glasses of wine did you have today? <laughs> um, and I said, none, because I usually don't drink at, at, uh, at lunchtime. Um, so I started looking at the idea more seriously. We went to the dean. We talked about it. It was unusual because I was a full professor. He was a, a non-tenured assistant professor. Um, and also that would have required a partial leave from the university. You know, all sorts of complications. But in the end, the dean agreed. Um, so for three years, I basically kept working as a biologist, running the lab and everything. And then in the afternoon, early evening, going to the other side of campus and taking courses in philosophy. Now, initially, the project was not, the idea was not to change full-time to philosophy. It was just to integrate these two strands that were interesting to me, the empirical side of biology and the more philosophically oriented one. Um, but then, you know, little by little, I kind of had more and more fun doing the philosophy. And so uh, by that time, I moved to Stony Brook. Uh, and then uh, I decided that, uh, you know what, Long Island is interesting, but not as interesting as, as New York City. So I decided to move to the city, and I started commuting out to Long Island. That's a, if you're, it's a two hour commute by train each way. So that was not sustainable. After a while, I started looking for a job and in the city. And uh, I figured, well, I can't really be choosy because I want to be in the city. I'm a senior professor. There's not going to be a lot of jobs available. So whatever comes up, if it is biology, it's biology. If it's philosophy, it's philosophy. Turned out it was philosophy. It was a, a CUNY, City University of New York, position and they hire me and that's it. Uh, wow, that's a really productive midlife crisis, I must say. <laughs> yeah. uh, most, most guys uh, that I know of just have an affair or, you know, they, they get a new car. <laughs> yep, that's right. <laughs> uh, so uh, good for you. Um, Thank you. So here's the question I have for you. I, you know, so I'm, I have never switched careers. I've been a science journalist um, for more than 30 years now. Uh, so I started, I still am. Um, but I love philosophy. I, I feel as though I, I have ended up writing a lot about philosophical issues. And um, one of the questions that nags at me and that I like to write about is what's the point of philosophy? Yeah. What are, what, what are philosophers trying to do? So yeah. I, I, I put that question to you. What, what for you is the point of philosophy? It's a damn good question. Uh, and in fact, I've written uh, uh, such a large number of posts under that um, in order to answer that question on one of my previous blogs that they're now collected in what is about the size of a book. Um, but I'll try to give you the short answer, at least the way I see it. But before you, I do that, so it's interesting you mentioned that you know, you've been a, a science journalist all your life. That was actually my uh, second plan when I started out as a biologist. Uh, I was in Italy, and the chances of getting an academic position in Italy were not that good. So I had a friend of mine, Franco Foresta Martin, who works as a science journalist for the Corriere della Sera, which is the second largest Italian newspaper. Mm -hmm. And when I graduated from college, he put me uh, uh, in front of an interesting possibility. He said, look, if you, have, if you want a job at the Corriere, you have it. You, can, you, you, know, you write well, so you can, you can be a science journalist. And I said, oh, damn, this is really difficult. In the end, I decided to be a biologist, but I could have just as easily at that point in my life just flipped around and things would have gone in a completely different uh, direction. Okay, so what, what the hell is the point of philosophy? I think that part of that answer has to include a brief detour in the history of philosophy. Uh, because when we talk, we, we have a tendency to talk about science and philosophy and, you know, these things kind of, as if they were immutable essences that, 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 that you know, like sharply defined and, and, you know, sort of clearly uh, understand. It, they're not like that at all, right? They're human activities, both of them, uh, and therefore they evolve. 
over time. And arguably, even though we tend to think of science in the modern sense of the term as starting out in the you know, 16th, 17th century with the scientific revolution, in fact, you can argue that science started out with the pre-Socratic philosophers uh, in ancient Greece because they were the first ones that rejected uh, you know, mystical uh, answers to the question of how the world works and instead starting to looking for to think about stuff and looking at how you know and observing the world as it is you can argue that that was the first step that eventually led to what we think of as science for a long time science and philosophy were indistinguishable right and a lot of people don't realize for instance that the term scientist was invented by a philosopher William Will who was one of Charles Darwin's mentors and it's it goes back to only the beginning of the 19th century. So it's pretty recent, right? Uh, if you asked uh, uh, Galileo, Newton, and Darwin himself, they would have told you that they were natural philosophers. They, they had no, no notion of you know, science as a separate, separate discipline. So that, all of that has to factor in. Aristotle was just as much a philosopher as he was a scientist. He was going around doing observation and dissection of animals. Uh, you know, particularly um, you know, aquatic life forms, mollusks, and things like that. So he was doing biology. He wrote books on physics. So, right, and uh, one of the contemporaries of Galileo was Rene Descartes. Now, we think today of Descartes as a philosopher and uh, Galileo as, a, as a, a physicist, you know, as a scientist. They didn't think of it that way. And the only reason we, we, think, we do think of it that way is because Descartes' physics was not as good as Galileo's. And Galileo's philosophy was not as good as Descartes. But other than that, <laughs> it's like, so what I'm saying is part of the answer is there is no sharp difference between science and philosophy. There has never been, certainly from the beginning, and even now that they are their own specific academic disciplines, science, of course, is not a, a single thing. It's a bunch of things. You know, you have physics, you have biology, you have chemistry, you have geology, and these tend to spin off uh, in, in separate, in separate sub-areas. Nobody does science in the general sense of the term. That's just too broad of, of a field, right? And very few people do philosophy in the broad sense either. I mean, there is philosophy of science, philosophy of, of mind, metaphysics, aesthetics, and so on, logic, and so on and so forth. So, so that's the historical perspective. Yeah. Now, an important part of that development is that philosophy has spun off pretty much all of the scientific disciplines that we recognized as such today, right? It started out with mathematics, actually. Whether you think of mathematics as a science or not, we can have that discussion. I actually don't. But, um, but mathematics spun off pretty early, right? Uh, it sort of became independent already in, during ancient Greece and Rome. Um, then much later on, we have physics. This is the first one of the modern sciences to, to spin off. Galileo and Newton determined essentially the, the independence of physics. Um, Boyle got, got chemistry starting. Um, Darwin got biology started, started. James got psychology started. Uh, Alan Smith got economics started. If you want to think of economics as a science, that's again another thing that we can discuss, right? So, but you see what I'm talking about. And even philosophy of mind is now slowly being replaced by uh, neuroscience, cognitive science, and that sort of stuff. I mean, until like 20 years ago, nobody was talking from a scientific perspective about the study of consciousness. Nobody had any idea how to do it. Mm -hmm. Now, what's the thread here? The common thread is that certain questions are, um, questions are philosophical in nature when they are a matter of conceptual clarification, of thinking about what, what does the question entail, which, which way should we think about a particular subject matter. As soon as the questions become amenable to empirical answers, they become a science. They spin off. Right. Right. So now what so if if I if we stop the analysis here, then you will conclude that philosophy is getting smaller and smaller, right? Because all this stuff spins off and science is getting bigger and bigger. But it's not quite that simple because then every time that one of these things spins off, philosophers now have a new field uh of of interest to think about. So for instance, I'm a philosopher of biology, right? Well let me sorry, let me just yeah, uh sure. Disconnect my phone. Sure. Sorry, just a spam call. Yeah, that's all right. Yes. <laughs> it happens. Um, so, so imagine, for instance, you know, I'm a philosopher of biology, right? Um, well, what does that mean exactly? Uh, it means that philosophers are no longer in the business, like Aristotle was, of doing biology. 
There's biologists that are doing that sort of stuff, right? It's, it's a profession at this point. But there are a number of issues in biology in terms of practice, in terms of connection between uh, the, the, the empirical research that is done in biology and the theoretical claims that are made or the general claims that are made within biology. Those are actually conceptual issues. And those conceptual issues are the ones that philosophers of biology are interested in. As I said, the, the species problem is one, but also, for instance, the evolution of evolutionary theory. One of the things that I've been running most about over the last several years is well, what is happening to biology from a theoretical perspective is what people call the extended evolutionary synthesis an entirely new theory compared to what was the, sort of the standard model in, in biology uh, that uh, coalesced um, uh, around the 1930s and 40s. Is it something completely different? Is it a continuation of it? What counts as a new theory? Uh, how does the theory make contact with, with the empirical realm and so on and so forth? Or take philosophy of physics. Um, a lot of philosophers of physics are interested in all these discussions that physicists themselves are having about, so is post-empirical science a science? Uh, is, is, you know, things like string theory or, or the multiverse or things like that. What, what, is, what is going on there? What about different interpretations of quantum mechanics? If you're talking about interpretations, that means that these are not empirically determined. It means that they are a matter of sort of thinking about stuff. So the relationship between, between science and philosophy keeps evolving all the time. Let me, let, me, um, uh, let me tell you what I think philosophy uh, should be doing or, or – uh, should be its main purpose. So I actually wrote a series for Scientific American about this. What's the point of philosophy? And yep, it, was, it. Um, it was inspired by this discussion. I belong to a philosophy salon in New York uh, with some people that you know. I always feel funny about saying their names because I'm not sure they, they want to be discussed uh, in public. But there's some honest to God, professional philosophers in this group. It's, and yep. then they, you know, they allow an amateur like uh, me to hang out and so I, I really enjoy it. And I feel privileged to be in on these conversations. One of the papers that we, and we, you know, we discuss a, a single paper uh, when we get together. One paper we discussed was by Dave Chalmers and the title was, is there progress in philosophy? Yeah. And, uh, and Chalmers had actually done uh, a big survey of philosophers on some of the, you know, the sort of grand questions of philosophy uh, concerning uh, God and free will and the nature of consciousness and the nature of morality. And he got all these diverse views. And so he concluded that philosophy, unlike science, never seems to converge on an answer to the big questions that it poses and uh, wrestles with. And um, But Chalmers in this piece uh, seemed to avoid the obvious conclusion that philosophy is incapable of achieving convergence or truth. And he said that, well, in the future, he said, oh, our methods keep getting better. And in the future, we might start resolving some of these questions. Yeah. Um, I instead concluded that philosophy today, in spite of philosophy and science being sort of of a piece in the past, today they're very different. And philosophy, you cannot expect it to solve problems. Uh, to uh, reach consensus. Um, and so then I asked, well, what is the point of philosophy then? And I, you know, I discussed some various possibilities. Uh, one is that philosophy is maybe a kind of art form. It just, just presents possible worlds in the same way that uh, artists do. Philosophy, maybe you could say its main goal today is to come up with uh, ethical systems for us. But the problem is that Whenever philosophers construct an ethical system like Kantianism or utilitarianism, then they somebody else comes along like Nietzsche and then demolishes it. Yeah. So there, yeah, and there are many well, modern. They think they demolish it, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I mean, we're going to get to stoicism and some of the, the yeah. uh, you know philosophical uh, behavioral systems eventually, but there are some very prominent. Um, modern philosophers, Bernard Williams is one of the people we read in a later class, who claim that, you know, the project of constructing a, a consistent morality um, has failed, and that uh, and that it's not going to succeed. And, and, yeah. And, with uh, all due respect, I disagree with, with Williams, but more importantly, I disagree with Chalmers. Um, I think Chalmers has misunderstood his own data. 
Okay. Well, um, let, me just, let me just get to my punchline, and, sure. and you probably know it. Um, but I think that the great project of, of philosophy today, it's, and, and its great, greatest usefulness, is, um, is fostering doubt and uncertainty. It's being kind of a counterweight to science. Scientists, I think, yeah. today and historically have had a very bad tendency to take some of their theories too seriously and to think that they really know how the world works. And this tendency gets us into trouble. Uh, whereas philosophers are always pointing out flaws in the logic and in the evidence behind some uh, scientific theories. And I think that is a very important and useful function. So anyway. Yeah, I agree. And in a sense, it's the function that Socrates was performing in Athens, right? That of, that of the gadfly, right? Yes. Right. Although ah, Socrates know. still had this, you know, still was presenting this possibility of escaping the cave and having the revelation of, you know, the true and the, and the good and, and the beautiful. Yeah, although that was arguably more Plato, meaning the, late, the later Plato, the more mature Plato than, than Socrates. But yeah, I actually would agree in part with what you just said. I think that is one of the roles of philosophy. Um, there are a couple more. Okay. Uh, one, it was articulated by one of the most important philosophers you never heard of, uh, likely, uh, uh, Wilfred Sellers. Uh, so he was active, you know, a few decades ago, and uh, he actually had big deal sort of uh, students, like Dan, Dan Etis was one of his students, and uh -huh. uh, Patricia Churchland was one of his students, and so on and so forth. So he had a lot of inter influence in terms of his students, but he, he himself is unfortunately not as well known as he should be. And uh, Sellers' uh, uh, notion is that one of the major uh, goals or, or functions of philosophy today, because as we said, it evolved over time, right? Uh, but today is to develop what he called the stereoscopic view of the world that puts together and reconciles and harmonizes what he called the scientific image and the manifest image. The scientific mm -hmm. image is what, whatever scientists tell us how the world works. And the, the manifest image is what seems to us the world works. Yeah. Now, why would you want to do that? Why would you want to put the two images together and sort of come up with this kind of stereoscopic vision? Because he reminded us that even science is just a human activity. It's about understanding and navigating the world. And you can't do it just on scientific grounds. You have to, we, we all, the rest of us, including, of course, scientists when they're not in the, their laboratory, we need a broader understanding of how things work, work how things hang together, and especially uh, what those, the scientific, um, what comes out of the scientific image tell us about things about which science has rather little to say, like values, uh, you know, judgments about what to do and what not to do, meaning, that sort of stuff. So I think that's, that's another good way, other than yours, it's another good way. So the gadfly, uh, let's say, to science is one role. The stereoscopic view, uh, reconciling or putting or harmonizing uh, the, the scientific and the manifest images is another role. But the third one emerges, I think, out of, uh, in part, out of um, Chalmers' work. So I actually wrote a number of, of uh, essays analyzing Chalmers' own results. And I think it draws the, the wrong, it's a really interesting study, but I think it draws the wrong conclusions mm -hmm. uh, from it. If you look at carefully, field by field, it turns out that the, the stereotypical notion that, you know, if there are 10 philosophers, they're going to have 11 opinions about something is, in fact, not true. His data do not, do not bear uh, that, that picture. It is true that there is no convergence to one answer in any subfield of philosophy, not in philosophy of science, not in epistemology, not in ethics, nowhere. But it is also the case that they're usually, in each one of these subfields, there's usually now two maybe three major positions that have been shaped and, and modified and amplified and refined over time by this process of continuous dialectic between different philosophers, criticism and counter-criticism and so on and so forth. And I think of those as uh, peaks in a conceptual landscape um, that is defined by a particular problem. Let's take the obvious example, uh, ethics, mm -hmm. right? So uh, in ethics, the three major ways of thinking about ethics, there's, there's more out there, but the three major ones are Kantian-style deontology, so rule-based ethics, uh, Mill-style uh, utilitarianism, or some kind of consequentialist ethics, and then virtue ethics broadly construed, usually the Aristotelian version, uh, although we can talk about the Stoic version later on. These are, I think, three 
peaks in the intellectual landscape, in the conceptual landscape, defined by the question, how should we live our life? Now, philosophers have, have, over thousands of years, examined a bunch of other possibilities and have discarded a bunch of those. Mm -hmm. um, and then they refined what was left. That, to me, counts as progress. Um, are we going to arrive at the true one? No, because I think that talking about true philosophical uh, systems is a category mistake. It's, it's really not what it is about. The way to judge, let's say, a Kantian, the Kantian system versus the utilitarian system versus virtue ethics is not whether they are true or not, because true with respect to what? Um, you know, in the case of science, truth is uh, essentially what philosophers call, is measured as what philosophers call a um, correspondence theory, right, of truth. Meaning, if I claim that it is true that Saturn has rings, what I mean is that if you actually go there and observe Saturn, you will see rings, right? My, my theory, my statement corresponds with reality out there. But ethics, uh, let's say, or epistemology, you know, what is, the, what is truth and that, they, they, there is no correspondence with stuff out there. The similarity there, the, the better par uh, parallel is with logic or with mathematics. Hmm. Like for instance, uh, take the Pythagorean theorem within Euclidean geometry. Is it true? Well, mathematicians sometimes use that word, but they don't mean that it corresponds to something out there. It's not like you, you're going to need experiments on triangles to figure it out. It is true, meaning that it is internally coherent and derived by certain axioms, right? You change the axioms, you shift from Euclidean to non-Euclidean geometry, and it, it doesn't work anymore. So how do mathematicians measure um, what they are doing, the, the, the progress in what they're doing? Well, what they're doing has to be, the, the theorems that they come up with has, have to be coherent, because if they're incoherent, they're not a, they're not a good start. And they have to be useful mm. for something, whatever, the, whatever the, the utility function is, but they have to be useful. So there are entire areas of mathematics that have been explored and then kind of set aside, because like, oh, okay, they're not leading anywhere. And then others that are very important, very productive, both in terms of internally, in terms of mathematics itself, and externally, in terms of science. The same goes, I think, for, for all of the major branches of philosophy. In ethics, for instance, it doesn't make any sense to ask whether Kantian deontology is true, but it does make sense to ask whether it is internally coherent, whether there are contradictions, whether there are tensions that can not be resolved easily. It also makes sense to ask, well, is it useful? Are, are we, you know, can, we, can somebody live a Kantian life or a utilitarian life or something like that? Let me, let me just ask you this. This is a question that... that has concerned me for a while. Um, so, you know, when I became a science journalist in, uh, in the 1980s, uh, there was all this excitement that physicists were going to produce a theory of everything, a, you know, a unified theory that might also tell us how the universe came into existence, why it has the structure uh, that, that it has, um, right. which allowed for our eventual emergence. And there was something akin to a theory of everything in other fields as well. Um, you know, there were some philosophers like Ernst Mayer who were talking about um, the, the new synthesis as being a kind of theory of everything, which, when, which within which there were a lot of questions that still needed to be resolved. But it was a kind of final framework for understanding uh, biological systems. Francis Crick was talking in the early 90s very optimistically about possibly solving the problem of uh, of consciousness. And so I, I began to take seriously the idea of the branches of knowledge converging on a correct picture of the world. Right. And it seems to me that the way you were talking about the, the, the stereo, the, the stereoscopic, is that stereoscopic, what? Stereoscopic, yeah, yeah, that's right. Stereos, stereoscopic model of relationship between science and uh, philosophy would sort of be an enhanced version of that, that the scientists, I mean, that the philosophers would be sort of telling us what the, the scientific picture of the world meant um, and giving us a, a satisfying uh, narrative within which we can understand our own lives. And this would be uh, replacing some of the traditional um, religious narratives, let's say. So convergence on the truth really about the world. And um, I, you know, so I, my first book, The End of Science, was sort of examining uh, yeah. that possibility, and I concluded that um, 
it wasn't going to happen because now our knowledge is too limited in, in, uh, in many ways. And over time, but I still thought that was a desirable outcome. I no longer think that convergence on truth um, is a good thing. I'm not a postmodernist. I do think science, scientists figure some things out. But when it comes to some of the really deep questions about the nature of the universe, about our own nature, the mind-body problem, and things like that, um, I'm worried about our yearning for certainty. And also, and I think that we are constantly, if you look, look at uh, the history of science, we're constantly tricking ourselves into believing that we really have figured things out. Yeah. And this has sometimes led to really terrible uh, consequences to scientific ideology yeah. uh, leading to, um, you know, bad social movements, even like, uh, you know, totalitarian communism or fascism and things like that. So I guess I'm, this goes back to my, my idea that philosophy should be skeptical and yeah. should be sowing doubt, especially when it comes to science's uh, pictures of the world, but also when it comes to our, our uh, ethical systems, um, because first of all, I don't think as time has, has gone on, I've become less and less confident that our scientific picture of the world is, uh, is uh, accurate. And also I'm worried about um, our ability to convince ourselves that even our, our ethical systems are, are valid. Yeah. Uh, so I, you know, I guess I'm just looking for a response to this. I sympathize with a lot of what you say. Um, I guess I, I take a slightly different um, view on things. So, so on the one hand, I do think that science, as we understand it today, is pretty much the only game in town when the questions have to do with how the world works. Yeah. That is, right? So, so whether it is the fundamental constituents of the universe or consciousness or whatever it is, if the question is empirical, science is pretty much the only game in town that doesn't mean we're, we're always going to get to answers right? right because we keep forgetting or, or especially some scientists keep forgetting that science is a human epistemic activity human beings are limited you know there is only so much brain power that we have there is only so much access that we have to the pertinent information for instance my one, one of my examples usually in this in this area is the origin of life question I am extremely skeptical that we will ever solve the question of the origin of life. Hmm. That's not necessary, not, not because it's, I mean, there's something mystical going on there or, or you know, life is something. It's, it's not uh, approachable by science. It's just because there's not information. There's not enough information left over. Right. And therefore, we run into one kind of epistemic limitation that science has. So uh, a colleague of mine, Richard Lewontin, uh, was um, until recently a, a geneticist at Harvard, of, you know, one of, actually one of, arguably one of the, most influential population geneticist over the last part of the 20th century. At one, at one point, he was uh, asked to write a uh, sort of dissenting or skeptical uh, chapter on a book about the evolution of cognition. And, and at some point, there's this wonderful phrase that he writes in that chapter where he says, you know, we, we got to get off of this childish idea that just because we're curious about something, we're going to find the answer. Sometimes we are, sometimes we're not. And it's okay. I mean, it's like, you know, if you do the best you can, that, then at some point you have to, to say, well, that, I got to this point and that's it. So that, that's why I think, like, for instance, all these discussion about, you know, multiverse and string theory and physics, they may be resolved one day. But it's all, it also may indicate that physicists are bumping against a limit that they're not going to be able to overcome simply because either they're too limited in terms of you know, their own mind and the way they think about stuff, or they just don't have enough information. And well, if, you know, if you can never get that information, then you have to say, well, okay, I'm okay with that. Well, so um, another dimension of this, I mean, you could have this kind of discussion and assume that all scientists are acting in good faith, right? But then there's also the problem when science kind of shades over into an ideology that starts bullying yeah. alternative belief systems and uh, over-promising and overstating and exaggerating yeah. the degree to which it's really figured things out. And uh, when it comes to multiverses um, and uh, strings, I mean – who cares? But when it comes to fields like, um, I don't know, psychiatry, uh, 
yep. or, uh, or even uh, behavioral genetics, um, then there are serious consequences to these things that can affect mm -hmm. us on a political and social level and, it, and can affect our health. So I'm worried, I've written some, some blog posts recently suggesting that science is becoming, I, I actually had a, a post titled um, Jeffrey Epstein and the Decadence of Science. Uh, <laughs> I, I think the, the fact that science in the United States is happening in the context of capitalism has proved to be um, unhealthy in some ways. Uh, yeah. and, and again, this is, this is especially true in, in fields where the financial stakes are enormous and, you know, main. No, main I, agree, I agree. I mean, there's, uh, with a colleague of mine, Martin Baldry at the University of Ghent a few years ago, uh, we put out a collection of essays called Science Unlimited, with question mark. And that, quite, that collection addresses the issue of scientism, which is part of what you're talking about. These, yes. These overconfidence, yeah. these overpromising, these bullying, uh, that uh, some scientists, and I shouldn't mention name, but I will anyway, uh, Stephen Hawking, Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, Sam Harris, uh, you know, you name it. This, this is a number Krauss, of Stephen Yes, Krauss. Lawrence Gauss. Uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> That's a big one. Um, all of these people, you know, brilliant as they are, the problem is they, they do exactly what you just said, you know, over-promising mm -hmm. and, and sometimes bullying. And yes, when we're talking about string theory, who cares, except, of course, that like you know, millions of some Sometimes billions of dollars go into that kind of research. So there is some practical consequence there too. But most importantly, yes, when it comes to neuroscience, psychiatry, uh, you know, the, the kinds of science, medicine, uh, I mean, people seem not to be particularly bothered by the fact that psychology, medicine, uh, and uh, other related disciplines are going through a massive uh, replication crisis. Yes. Where even findings that, have, that, that, are, that, are not, that are now published in textbooks are actually not repeatable. It's like, whoa. That, that ought to be a big red alarm going off all the way, all, all, all the time. And it just doesn't. It's like, oh, okay, well, sure. What do you mean, sure? You, you're going to go to a doctor, and the doctor is going to give you something based on research that turns out to be not replicable or turns out to be, uh, you know, biased because it was funded by the pharmaceutical industry. Does that not bother you? It should. Right? Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah, this is a terrible problem. I, you know, I, I, I want to make sure we get to – skepticism and uh, philosophy as a kind of guide to living your life. Uh, yeah. so maybe we can switch to that sure. now. Um, uh, why, um, I mean, stoicism, why, why stoicism? How, how did you, how did you become a stoic? It was part of the same process that I was mentioning earlier that my shift in career. So one of the things that was happening at the same time is like, is like I wasn't concerned just about my career and what I would do in, you know, on, the, on the job for the next few decades, um, but also in terms of, so how do I think about my own life and what's important to me and you know, what kind of guideposts, what kind of framework of reference um, do I use? And of course, that is what ethics arguably is about. It's providing you with a frame of reference. Uh, for what you do, you know, prioritizing things and, you know, helping you out figure out meaningful, what is meaningful and what is not. Um, now, I grew up Catholic in, 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 in Italy, in Rome, like literally next to the Pope. Um, uh, you know, my, my apartment was not far uh, from the Vatican. And, but I left the church when I was in my teenage years because I didn't get answers to pretty straightforward questions. You know, I remember uh, going to my priest uh, and say, so this, this transubstantiation thing, explain to me how that works again. So you're telling me that when I go to communion and I eat the wafer and drink the, the wine, I'm actually literally eating the flesh of Christ and drinking his blood? He said, yeah, literally. Are you sure? This is not a metaphor. <laughs> yeah, it's literal. I said, that's bullshit. <laughs> I'm sorry. So that's that I left. Um, now, once I left, uh, I kind of almost immediately embraced, because of philosophy, I was reading Bertrand Russell, for instance, uh, and because of philosophy, I embraced immediately what is known as psychohumanism, right? So I, I always considered myself a psychohumanist. Um, in fact, I wrote for psychohumanist magazines over later on in, in my, my career. Um, but when the, the actual crisis hit, when, when the... the the rubber hit the road, so to speak, like, okay, now I need resources to sort of think about what am I going to do next? Secular humanism turned out to be completely useless hmm. because 
uh, when I looked back to it and I, I went through the you know, various versions of the Psycho Humanist Manifesto, it turned out to be just a list of things that I agreed with. But, yeah. you know, oh, uh, people should be respectful of other people's rights. Uh, you know, no discrimination again by gender. Yeah, sure, fine. But that's not really helpful for tell, to tell me what I'm, I'm supposed to do with my life right now that I'm in a crisis. So I said, well, I'm, you're studying philosophy. This is the time to turn to philosophy uh, as a practical thing and not just as a sort of theoretical enterprise. Now, it struck me immediately that if, this, if, if I was going to find an answer, this was going to come from the general area of virtual ethics. And the reason for that is, is uh, to me at least, is very clear. Other ethical systems, let's, such as utilitarianism or Kantian deontology and so on and so forth, they actually don't tell you how to live. They're not, they're not helpful in, in, in that sense. They only tell you, they only answer the question of, is this action right or wrong? Mm. Okay. That's certainly important. I mean, you know, we want to know that, um, but it's not enough. It isn't, they don't tell you anything about priorities in life, meaning, you know, that, that sort of sort of broader thing. So at some point I kind of flirted with Buddhism. Uh, you know, I started reading because that's the, one of the obvious things that Westerners do. Oh, I heard this Buddhism thing. Let me let me take a look at it. Yeah. And you know, I saw that the ethics, the Buddhist, Buddhist ethics, was great. It was you know, lots of good stuff going on there. The metaphysics turned me completely off. The language did not speak to me. Arguably, probably just because of you know cultural differences. I just I didn't grow up reading that that stuff. So it's like okay, Buddhism is out. Um, well, let me ask you though, did you try meditating? Yeah. Yes, I did. Okay. And, and it was somewhat useful. Um, but, but, you know, meditation, uh, I just finished reading, actually, a uh, rereading uh, a, a chapter on Buddhism by o Owen Flanagan um, that was just published in a book that I co-edited with um, Sky Cleary and Dan Kaufman. It's called How to Live a Good Life. Right. And it's 15 chapters. Each chapter is written by somebody who not only studies, but also lives a particular philosophy or religion, right? And uh, Owen there makes an interesting point. He says, you know, a lot of Westerners think of Buddhism as meditation, basically, or almost entirely as meditation. But in fact, your average Buddhist in countries where Buddhism is practiced meditate no more than the average Christian prays. Huh. It's like, it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not that big of a, it's a technique, obviously, and it's, it's important. It's part of the practice. It's useful for certain things, but it's certainly not the philosophy. The philosophy is far broader than, than, than just you know, meditation. But I did try meditation, yes, and it was helpful for certain things. Um, but the philosophy itself was not, was not hitting me in the right way. So I figured, okay, well, let's go to the Western canon. What do I find there? Virtual ethics seems to be the right ballpark, largely because virtual ethics asks a different kind of question, from other ethical systems, modern ethical systems. The question that they ask is, what does it mean to be a good person? Mm. Right? It's not what is right and what is wrong, but what does it mean? What makes you for a good person and how do you get there? Say, so, okay, well, that seems like what I'm interested in. So let's see. Now, if you go to virtual ethics, the first thing you do is Aristotle. Lots of good things. I read the Nicomachean ethics, interesting stuff, uh, except that, first of all, there is no practice associated with it, unlike with Buddhism. But you know, Aristotle was just not interested in the practice, apparently. He was just like, you know, very theoretical guy. But also, Aristotelianism, uh, the Aristotelian version of virtual ethics, comes across as very elitist. So Aristotle says, you know, for a good life, you need to be a virtuous person, you know, have a good character and all that, fine. But you also need a bit of education, a bit of money, a bit of good looks. And I say, all right, that's it. I'm, I'm done. I'm, a, I'm out. Um, this reflects probably Aristotle's own background. He was an aristocrat. You know, he was, his father was a doctor at the Macedonian king's court and that sort of thing. Okay. So the next stop was Epicureanism. Why? Well, because it's also kind of virtue ethics and it's very popular among uh, secular humanists. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is, is uh, are, are interesting. For one thing, Epicurus, although he was not an atheist, was very skeptical of organized religion. He said, you know, forget the priests. They're just trying to you scare the shit out of you and, 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 and uh, control, in order to control you. There is no afterlife. Don't worry about it. God doesn't give a damn about you. So, you know, just, just no, no reason to have to be fearful. Also, the Epicureans were atomists. So they were materialists, right? So that goes kind of feels good in terms of modern science. Uh, yeah. Of course, we are not atomists in that sense, but it's like, you know, it's going in the right direction. So I read Epicurus, the little that there is um, left of Epicurus, and especially the Rerum Natura, which is this beautiful poem by uh, Lucretius on the, on the nature of things, which is a major source, actually, of Epicurean philosophy. 
And he's like, great, this is going great. They, they put a lot of uh, emphasis on, on friendship and it's all, you know, it's all about not having fear about, of death. And, not, and then it's like, oh, but the major goal of an Epicurean life is to live without pain, especially emotional pain. Mm-hmm. Right? But Epicurus literally defined absence of pain as the highest pleasure. Mm-hmm. They're like, okay, well, that sounds good. Except that the major, a major part of the recipe for living a life without uh, pain is to stay away from social and political involvement. Huh. Because as you know, they are, in fact, painful. Right? I mean, we, we're experiencing it right now with the guy in charge uh, in the White House. It's like, it's, it is painful. Mm-hmm. But I said, no, that, that's not for me. I can't imagine a meaningful life where there is no social or political involvement for me. So that was out. Mm. So there I was, right? Buddhism, man, it doesn't talk to me. Aristotelian is too elitist. Epicureanism, no politics. It's like, and yet I was still convinced that the answer was going to be in that ballpark. So I was kind of thinking about it. And then one day, I was looking at my Twitter feed, of all things, and I see this thing that says, help us celebrate Stoic Week. It's like, what the hell is Stoic Week? And why would anybody want to celebrate the Stoics? And then little by little, I kind of connected the dots and said, wait, wait a minute, the Stoics. Oh, that's Marcus Aurelius. Yes, that's right. So I, I read the meditations in, in, in college and it's like, yeah, it was interesting. I never thought of it as a philosophical system, but it was kind of interesting. And then Seneca, Seneca, I translated Seneca in Latin in high school, from Latin in high school. Huh. And, but I never put the two together. I never actually imagine that these were actually talking about the same kind of stuff like okay let me take a look so i uh signed up i downloaded their their manual for living like a stoic for a week which basically gives you minimum background about stoicism a list of readings and a list of practices you know, meditation exercises uh journaling you know that sort of stuff and it hit me immediately it's oh. just like it clicked like nothing before particularly the first Stoic that I read was Epictetus. Now, mind, mind you, at that time, I had a PhD in philosophy already, and I never heard of Epictetus, not once. It's, like, it's not even, you know, it doesn't, doesn't emerge in any, in any even, even in ancient, I took it, courses in ancient philosophy, and Epictetus never, never mentioned. It's like, what the hell? Why did I never hear of this guy before? It turns out Epictetus was actually a highly influential philosopher all the way up to the 19th century, and then it kind of eclipsed I got into a sort of eclipse, uh, which I hope is going to be partial because um, it's, it really is an, in, an incredible guy. So I start reading the discourses. And one of the first things that I hear that I, that I read in the discourse is like, um, so you have money. Well, that's good for you. Uh, now, what are you going to do with the money? Because the money isn't going to tell you. Reason is going to tell you what to do with the money. So, oh, that's interesting. Okay. And then two, you know, two paragraphs later, the guy says, um, sure, one of these days I have to die. But it looks like it's not going to be today. On the other hand, I'm kind of hungry, so let's go for lunch. I said, this guy's blunt, talks very basic, you know, sort of understandable language. Um, the more you read him, the more it looks like he really knew what he was talking about. It's like, all right, so let me do this thing seriously. So I did, uh, I committed to study and practice in Stoicism for a couple more months after Stoic Week. And then after that, I committed for another year. And now here we are, close to six years later, and we're still talking about it. Let, let me, okay, so let me, um, this raises um, a big question for me, and it's related to uh, the questions we talked about at the beginning of this conversation about uh, what's the point of philosophy. I'm curious whether um, reason and sort of deep reflection can, one, make you happy to make you a nicer person. And I'd, I'd add wisdom, except I'm not even sure how to define it. Maybe wisdom is some kind of combination of uh, happiness and, and, uh, and niceness. Um, It seems to me from my experience, I'm 66 years old now. I've, I, you know, I've spent a lot of time, uh, examining my myself, you know, I'm I'm an intellectual. I'm somebody who has tried to use reason to be happier and to be nicer. And I've seen a lot of other people do it too. I know a lot of professional philosophers. I know a lot of Buddhists who are also trying to use an, a rational analysis to to uh, be happier. Bob Wright, the you know the guy yeah, who receives sure. the site, is uh, is a good example of that. 
I haven't seen any evidence that rational analysis and reflection do lead to either happiness or, um, or niceness. So let me just start by asking you, do you feel that stoicism has really made you a better person, happier yeah. person and a, and a nicer person? Yeah, absolutely. Although I shouldn't say myself about being a nicer person, you should ask my friends. Right. Um, so let's start with happiness. Okay, happiness is not the point. Okay. Right? Um, in fact, it's not the point of any of these philosophies. Um, this, the same chapter that I just mentioned by Owen uh, Flanagan on Buddhism ends with a discussion of happiness and says people embrace, you know, go to attractive, especially in the Western world, to Buddhism because they think it's, it's going to make them happy. And he says, in a sense, this has absolutely nothing to do, and it's a fundamental misunderstanding of Buddhism because the point of Buddhism is to limit, to decrease suffering your own, and that of every other sentient being. Mm -hmm. And if you, are, if you embrace it in order to, to, to become happy, in a sense, you're kind of doing exactly the wrong thing because one of the major doctrines of Buddhism is this no-self doctrine, um, which is not the notion that there is no self. It's the notion that you should be less attached to your ego um, because that is what causes suffering, both for you and for other people. And so if you start out with the, with the question of what is going to make me happy, that's just the wrong way to approach things, right? Um, the same goes for stoicism. The question in stoicism is not, uh, is this going to be make me happy? But it is, to use the Greek term, is it going to make me eudaimon? Eudaim eudaimonia is the, the word that the ancient Greeks used to indicate a life worth living, mm -hmm. right? The kind of life that you get to the end of it and you look back and say, yeah, that was not wasted. You know, it's, it, it, was, it was okay. It was pretty good. Um, it's not happiness, whatever people mean by happiness, right? Because if by happiness we mean a feeling in the moment, um, sure, I am sometimes happy and sometimes not, like just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, if you mean a sense of purpose and meaning, then that gets closer uh, because both Buddhism and Stoicism do provide, provide you in a very similar, as it turns out, uh, way, a kind of a sense of meaning. But mostly it is about making you a better person. Um, they define better person in different ways, but they're not that different. For the Buddhist, the better person is somebody who's less attached to his ego and more concerned about the suffering of others. For a Stoic, a better person is somebody who uses the uh, arguably most unique of, of uh, humans' properties, which is the ability to reason, to improve the human cosmopolis, to improve things for everybody, uh, to, to make a better social, social living. So it really is about helping others and being more helpful uh, uh, as a member of human society. Now, is it working? Well, uh, in the case of stoicism, we have some data um, indirectly, but we have some data. For and There are two sources of data. First of all, the people that, are organized, that have been organizing Stoic Week for many years now, some of, the, of those people are actually psychologists, and they're interested in doing research on the effects of practicing uh, stoicism. So they actually have data um, mm -hmm. that... Uh, in a preliminary fashion at the moment, but does suggest that actually people do tend to improve uh, along the lines that are with, with practice and on the lines that are sort of set out by stoicism. But the other thing is, the other source of, again, indirect evidence, but it's pertinent, I think, is the fact that stoicism gave origin to what we today call cognitive behavioral therapy. Right. Uh, in its early form, uh, known as rational emotive behavior therapy, that's the one that Albert Ellis uh, got started, and then into actual cognitive behavioral therapy, Aaron Beck and, and his followers. Turns out that both of those people actually were directly inspired by uh, the Stoics, especially Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus. And so a lot of the early uh, CBT was really implementing Stoic techniques um, mm -hmm. to address people's problems. And as you probably know, CBT is in fact one of the best evidence-based therapies that are out there. Now, a therapy is not the same thing as a philosophy of, of life, obviously. A therapy is supposed to... Yeah, I'll, I'll get to that later. Go yeah. ahead. A, a, a therapy is supposed to address immediate problems like, you know, mm -hmm. a phobia or a depression or things like that. Uh, but the techniques do work. Of course, statistically, not for everybody. You know, this is, this is not physics. This is not fundamental physics. It's psychology. But, but they do work. Um, in terms of stoicism more broadly... Well, if it doesn't work, you're not doing it right. <laughs> because, um, right? Because, in a, because it's telling you, you know, the whole point of it is that you should try to be more concerned about human beings, more sympathetic about 
uh, you know, and, and helpful to other people. Um, let me address briefly the issue of reason, because you seemed a little skeptical about that part, and, and, um, and I can see why. Um, but one of the reasons I was, I am a, 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 a sort of um, really attracted to the Stoic approach is because un unlike other philosophies, they really don't make any distinction between reasons and emotions. Mm -hmm. They're not dualists of any sort. They're really mo strongly monist. The, uh, for the Stoics, and it turns out for modern cognitive behavioral science, um, and what we call emotions fall into two ca categories. On the one hand, there's kind of the raw feeling of the immediate reaction that you have to certain things. Like, for instance, you know, a loud bang in this, at, the, at this moment in my apartment would make me jump and, and have the rush of adrenaline, that sort of stuff, right? That's a raw feeling. It's not what the Stoics would consider an emotion. It's entirely not under your control. There's nothing you can do about it. it you just take it for what it is. Uh, often it's a signal that something may be wrong or you know, in, either externally or internally, fine. But it's not an emotion. What they call an emotion is a combination of those raw feelings, the, the, the physiological in, uh, interaction, an implied judgment about what those feelings mean, and then an explicit judgment about those feelings. So in other words, let's say that there is that bang now in the, in the, you know, in the background, and after I jump, I say, oh, it must be that terrorists are attacking me, because that can be the only explanation for why there was a loud bang. And now I'm really afraid, I'm freaking out, et cetera, et cetera. What I've done there is to uh, combine a cognitive judgment of a particular kind with the initial emotional reaction, and you get the full-fledged emotion. Now, I'm, af now I'm, I'm afraid, okay, in a, in a sort of more complex sense of the term. And a lot of stoicism is about challenging the cognitive part. Hmm. It's, by, it's about saying, Naturally, it's not likely that the best, alter, the best explanation for what's going on here is a terrorist attack. In fact, what the hell are you thinking about? You know, that's not a proper way to think about it. Calm the hell down and see what, what's actually happening. Right? Uh, so, so this is the model. So when we're talking about reason versus emotion, the Stoics don't, make that, don't recognize that distinction. They think that the whole thing is it's all in one, and then therefore you can challenge your emotion. A lot of people say, oh, I can't help by feeling this way. Or, you know, I'm, I, this, this is my emotional response. I can't help it. And both the Stoics and the cognitive behavioral therapists would say, of course you can help it. Right. It requires mindfulness. It requires uh, practice. But yes, you can help it because it turns out that your reactions are based on sometimes unexamined, uh, sort of uh, taken for granted cognitive assessments. And those cognitive assessments may be wrong, may be incorrect. Okay, let me let me give you a little pushback on a couple of things, sure. and because uh, we're we're reaching the hour point, and uh, yeah, yeah. you know th these are we're not going to resolve these things. Uh, these no. are pretty big questions. But first of all, um, uh, using some kind of uh, system, whether Buddhism or Stoicism or I don't know psychoanalysis or cognitive behavioral therapy, where you engage in some kind of reflection and you get certain outcomes. Um, uh, Eric, Sch and, and one, one practice could be just being an ethical philosopher, somebody who sure. thinks about morality for a living. Um, uh, Eric, Sch Eric Schwitz Gable, the, the, yeah. the ethical yeah. philosopher. Yeah. Uh, actually, I guess he, he philosophizes about a lot of things, but he had an empirical study yeah. of uh, examining the question of whether ethical philosophers are nicer than uh, other yeah. people. Unfortunately, he only compared them to other academics. Right. Uh, but he found that, uh, no, they're not nicer. Correct. Um, and uh, then he reflected on this and uh, concluded that actually philosophers, unfortunately, and he could even see this in, in himself, uh, tend to treat ethics as a kind of intellectual game, and it's not something that they necessarily apply to their own lives. If they do take it seriously, sometimes they use their cleverness to rationalize their own um, maybe immoral uh, impulses. Yeah, All right. no, so, he's absolutely right. So he's that, completely that's right. One thing. And by the way, there's actually a study that came out within a lot, the last year. I, I, I write, like writing about the... the um, uh, some of the downside of Buddhism or some of the evidence that it doesn't live up to its reputation because I, I figure this will irritate 
uh, my old friend Bob Wright. Right. So there, there have been attempts to quantify whether uh, meditation uh, makes you a nicer person. Yeah. And one big study that was published, I think roughly a year ago, concluded that no, it, it, uh, it doesn't. I think there's also the um, spectacular, spectacularly bad behavior of a lot of leading gurus and teachers within Buddhism and other uh, spiritual disciplines who, if anything, seem to be worse than average. You know, they yeah. turn into sexual predators. They prey <laughs> on their... Yeah. their uh, well, let, let, me, let me address those three points in reverse order. Okay, but there's... there's um, let me see. There's one, one other... Uh, oh, yeah. Going back to cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, th- this is sort of one global objection to all these systems we have, we've invented to try to help us cope with life better. A lot of it is about being happier, but that's sort of uh, intertwined with being a better person, being nicer as well. Yeah. I've been writing about psychotherapy uh, for decades now, and um, my conclusion, because I think this is what the clinical data show, is that all the systems are roughly equivalent. Cognitive behavioral therapy is very popular these days, in part just because it's cheaper and quicker than old-fashioned psychoanalysis, but there's really no good evidence uh, that it is more effective, however you might measure that, than any of the other psychotherapies that have ever been mentioned or that have ever been uh, uh, used. That includes all the variants of uh, psychoanalysis um, as well as, well, you know, there are hundreds of of these yeah. things out there now. That, that's not my reading of the literature, but but um, for that one, I think you might want to call uh, my friend Don Robertson, who is both a Stoic practitioner and a CBT uh, okay. <laughs> practitioner, because he knows the literature in detail. But let, let me go back to the three objections that you raised and sort of go in reverse order. Sure, there's, you always, especially when a philosophy is popular, such as Buddhism, Stoics is not even close uh, to, to Buddhism at this point, and probably will never be. But... Um, you will find a lot of what, uh, uh, again, quoting Owen Flanagan, he calls it budshit, uh, which is a particular kind of bullshit associated with Buddhism, right? So, you know, you will have people taking advantage of things and, and you know, distorting it, uh, making in their own business to make money and so on and so forth. I don't think that's an indictment of the, of the philosophy. It's just an indictment of those people. Okay. Um, if anything, you, it, it's something you would, ex- given human nature, you would expect that the more philosophy or a religion uh, becomes popular, the more you're going to find examples of that sort of stuff. Unfortunately, yeah. it's just the way it is. Um, now, the other two points that, that uh, you brought up, um, I think, are uh, more delicate. Now, let me see if I remember me, remember them. Uh, Are switchable, the, you know, the study of, oh, well, you already mentioned that. Yes. That one, the, that one is important. So that one is the first one you, you made. And the second one was about meditation, right? right. The effectiveness of meditation. So um, I looked at some of those studies, although probably not as close as, as you did, and especially not as close as Bob Wright. So you want to have a conversation with Bob about this one. But my first reaction uh, to that is that we need to be careful exactly what it is that these people were studying and with what subjects. Because as I mentioned earlier, meditation is actually only a minor component, uh, all things considered, of Buddhism as a philosophy. Um, uh, it would be like, for instance, uh, you go and study the, the, the um, effectiveness of yoga. Yoga is another philosophy uh, mm-hmm. that comes with physical practice, right? But if you just focus on, you say, okay, well, do people that go to uh, yoga classes, do they become better, better individuals? The answer I would expect is no, because they're not practicing the philosophy. They're practicing just the physical part of it. So if we're talking about people who meditate, Meditation per se isn't going to make you a better person. It has to be integrated with the broader system. So it would be interesting, to, and I'm just curious, it would be interesting to see whether these studies did take that into consideration, to what extent, et cetera. What I can say, on the other hand, with a little bit more uh, sort of background knowledge, is the studies, the first kind of studies you mentioned, the ones that showed that moral, professional moral philosophers are not better human beings than their academic colleagues. And I agree with you, it's unfortunate that they didn't include the broader control group, um, but you know, maybe they'll do it in the future. My response to that is, I would not expect anything differently, hmm. precisely because you, what you, you, you mentioned, that is, modern academic philosophy is not a practice for life, it's a theoretical game. Yeah. Just like a lot of, uh, to be fair, just like a lot of other academic disciplines. 
right? I mean, there is, I'm sure there is a lot of legal scholars who are not interested at all in justice and, and the law per se, but they're just, you know, it becomes a, a way to solve puzzles and to argue and to, 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 to enter into interesting sort of intellectual issues. There's nothing wrong with that, by the way. I think that that's fine. And academic, academic fields have their own reason for existing. But if you today go into the, a philosophy department with the question that got me started into this journey, right? So what kind of life should I live? I would say don't go into a philosophy department because, first of all, they have no idea what, they're, what you're talking about. They're probably going to laugh at you. Right. Um, right. So just don't do it, which is why stoicism is evolving almost entirely outside of academia. I mean, there are a few academics who are interested in, in the Stoic movement, so to speak. But it's mostly outside of academia. It's not most of the books, most of the uh, literature that is being developed has nothing to do with academics and certainly not with moral philosophers. Precisely because, so in other words, I don't see any contradiction there because, yeah, unfortunately, or it is what it is, moral philosophy as an academic study has nothing to do with moral practice. I know a lot of moral philosophers who are absolutely not only no better, but sometimes worse uh, than your average academic in terms of their own behavior. There are exceptions. And I think those exceptions are interesting. Like the obvious one that comes to mind is Peter Singer. Yeah. Now, Peter, uh, who I, I, I know personally, he's a really nice guy. I completely disagree with him in terms of sort of his chosen moral philosophy. But hey, that's a different discussion, right? Um, now, Peter really generally is a nice guy who really tries to live his philosophy. He really puts literally his money where his mouth is. Yes. Um, so, but why is he, an, is he an exception? Because in his case, he got to do the academic study because he was really interested in philosophy as an art of living, as they say huh. uh, sometimes, right? As a, as a way. So, to me, that shows that there is no contradiction really in, in the findings you mentioned, uh, which are interesting and unfortunate, but they're real. Uh, and the notion that a practical philosophy like Buddhism, Confucianism, Christianity, because let's not forget, in my book at least, religions are type of philosophy of life. Uh, right? Because I defined uh, at the beginning of that book of how to, how to live a good life that I mentioned earlier, um, I wrote the introduction for it, and I defined a philosophy of life as essentially made at a minimum of two components, um, often three. A, a metaphysics, which means an account of how the world works, an ethics, that is an account of how you should behave in the world, and more often than not, a set of practices. Mm -hmm. right? Well, if you think about it, that covers both philosophies of life and religions. Christianity fits perfectly, right? There, there are, there are it, it has a metaphysics, which uh, you know, talks about a God that exists outside of, of time and space and created the world, it's benevolent, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it has an ethics, obviously, you know, you're supposed to read the gospel and figure out uh, by example how to live your life. And it has exercises. I mean, literally, the, the, the Christians have, you know, praying is, an, is a practical exercise uh, mm -hmm. in Christianity. The, um, throughout the Middle Ages, interestingly, the Christian monks used actually Epictetus' uh, handbook as a manual for uh, spiritual exercises. So there's really no distinction there between a philosophy of life and a religion, with the difference, of course, being that in the case of religions, you're talking about scripture and gods. In the case of philosophies of life, you don't. So I feel free to disagree with Epictetus if I, when, whenever uh, the case may be, and because I don't think of his writings as uh, scripture and I don't think of him as Jesus. But other than that, they're essentially the same thing. I just have to mention one, one thing. We've got to wrap up soon, but I feel like I, I can talk, keep talking to you forever. I'm, I'm <laughs> so fascinated by these topics. Well, maybe we'll do another one. Okay. Uh, Jill Lepore, a few years ago, had a, had a profile of Seneca. And, yeah. um, and it just made him look I, like the biggest asshole. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, somebody in, she quoted a scholar saying that he's probably the greatest hypocrite in the history of civilization yeah. because he was an enabler for Nero, who was definitely one of the worst uh, tyrants in, yeah. uh, in history. Um, so it's just, it, it seems to me. Yeah, enough, but even, yeah, but even that is questionable. So I wrote an, an essay called Seneca was not a saint, uh, was not a sage which is the stoic term for, you know, the wise person. And mm -hmm. it, for sure, it was clearly, uh, you know, shall we say problematic at the very least. But uh, even scholars themselves are actually quite divided on the, on the topic. For, part of the reason is because we actually don't have enough documentation of what Seneca was thinking and doing and so on and so forth. We only have, you know, very partial evidence. 
but also because um, Seneca did some pretty gutsy things. For instance, one of his uh, one of the books that he wrote, one of the essays that he wrote, is dedicated to Nero. And if a scholar is uh, sort of like the one that you just mentioned, sort of tends to think negatively of Seneca, then that scholar will interpret that particular essay uh, as, oh, here's a panegyric for, for Nero, here's Seneca just telling Nero how great he is. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I read that thing. Seneca literally threats the emperor with, with his life in that thing. He says, you're great. You have a lot of things that you can do. You can do great for the Roman people. Careful, however, because if you turn into a tyrant, you know what happens to tyrants. That's a direct threat to the life of the emperor. And I don't know about you, but I think it takes guts to do that sort of stuff. Yes. It's, it's so, Seneca is complicated. Um, also, if you read the letters that he wrote to his friend Lucilius, uh, they're very eye-opening because there, in several passages, he basically says, look, don't follow me. I'm not a wise person. I'm a, uh, I've got a lot of problems. I haven't figured out how to live my life well. I'm, I'm a, just a sick person. So at some level, he was actually aware to the point of writing to his friend about this stuff. So it's true. I wouldn't pick Seneca as a role model for Stoics. I think that Marcus Aurelius is a better choice. Uh, Epictetus is an even better choice. Um, certainly not Seneca. But I think Seneca gets an undeservedly bad rap. Um, and, and you can tell this. This is not just me telling you this. If you look at the history of how Seneca has been... Um, uh, perceived and received mm -hmm. from the very beginning, beginning with his contemporaries, all the way to through the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, and today, you find the whole spectrum. People, some people think that he was a complete hypocrite and an asshole and so on and so forth. And the opposite, he was a, basically a secular saint. I think the truth is somewhere in between. Um, probably closer to the hypocritical part, but 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 not quite as bad as some people think. All right. Well, uh, I think maybe we should wrap it up there. That's uh, one's good. <laughs> that's pretty, I, you know, because I had just reread that essay in the New Yorker this morning, and yeah, uh, yeah I know which one you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it really made that Seneca look bad. Uh, so you've given a rousing defense of uh, Stoicism. I don't know if I'm I'm sort of anti systems in general. Um, I'm I'm like I don't even know if I can call myself a skeptic because I think of skepticism as another system. <laughs> um, so uh, I just kind of, you know, float through life and and uh, do what strikes me at the moment. Sure. Uh, but uh, but thanks a lot. That's been great. You you know you covered. Oh, thank you. This was a pleasure. <laughs> um, and maybe we should talk again because I still wanted to talk to you about. I know you you've written a lot about uh, the mind body problem and consciousness and panpsychism, yep. which are really in the air these days. Yep. Um, yeah. As well as. Uh, as skepticism in some of your writings about creationism and, and other uh, pseudoscientific. Uh, Anytime. So. All right. Thanks a lot, Masima. Bye. Uh, I'll talk to talk soon. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye.